So thank you to everybody for coming to, to um, our first non-folio related <laughs> uh, lecture here in the lecture hall um, through the State Library. I really appreciate you coming. Um, speaking with us today is Clive Thomas, and he's um, taught political science at UAS in Juneau for 30 years and ran the university's statewide legislat legislative internship program. And over the years, he's also done a lot of consulting and dealing with Alaska state government for a variety of local organizations. Um, he's put together an amazing book. It's, it's a thick tome, but it's filled with great information. And I'm sure he'll show it to you during his presentation at some point. We also have a copy back on the back desk if you'd like to take a look at it. So I'm sure you'd rather hear him speak than me. So without further ado, I'll say a quick welcome to the folks not here at the Andrew P. Cachavera building. And please um, join me in welcoming Clive Thomas. Well, thank you, Freya. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, let me say a little bit about uh, uh, why I'm here, and then I will get to do my talk here. I, I don't like to call it a lecture. It sounds extremely boring, and I did that for 30 years at UAS. Uh, anyway, I, uh, as Freya said, I've worked here at UAS for uh, 30 years. I left in 2011, and I now uh, am associated with the Foley Institute of uh, Public Service and Public Policy at Washington State University in Pullman, and I do a little bit of teaching for them, and mainly graduate stuff, and I work on... Uh, PhD committees, but that's basically what I do. I'm back in town here for a week, and then I'll be in Fairbanks and Anchorage to promote uh, this book that uh, the University of Alaska Press has just published. Uh, and so that's the reason I'm here. I've done a, quite a few little uh, stints here this week. I was on K2. Uh, I did a 360 North last night, which I think is going to be broadcast in about a week or so. I'm doing an evening at Egan tomorrow night at UAS from 7 until 8.30. Uh, and also I'm doing a book signing at the Nugget Mall Hearthside Books on Saturday between 3 and 5. And then at 5.10 on Sunday morning, I'm going to be leaving, I think. I'm not sure I can get up that early, but I'll try. Let me say a little bit about the book first, then I'll go into my talk. Okay, uh, I'll get it over here. If I could lift it up, it's kind of heavy. This is the book. It uh, took six and a half years to do it. It's uh, about Alaska politics and public policy. Its subtitle is The Dynamics of Beliefs, Institutions, Personalities, and Power. And it's 30 chapters, so it's very extensive. And it covers almost anything, uh, almost everything you want to know about Alaska politics. Uh, and probably some things you prefer not to know. It's uh, an edited book in the sense that there were 67 people contributed towards this book. Uh, 32 of them wrote chapters or co-authored chapters, and the rest did inserts. Uh, I don't want to go through all the names of the people involved, but many of them you'll know. Uh, three governors, Governor uh, Knowles, uh, Governor Hickel before he died, and Governor Sheffield, uh, several legislators, uh, Mike Dugan, of course, uh, also a journalist, uh, Harry Crawford, who may be coming back because he's running against Lance Pruitt, I guess, uh, and uh, Senator Green, who's also retired, journalists, Dave Donaldson, probably my best friend in the state, who uh, used to be APRN, and many other people like that. Uh, it's written not just for, it's not just an academic book, it's written for uh, everything from AP, advanced placement in high school, right through to graduate uh, school, and also for uh, the average reader. You say, how, well, how can you do all that in a book like this? Well, the University of Alaska Press, when they first approached me about this in 2009, wanted a book that could cover all those areas because Alaska being a small state population-wise, even today, less than 740,000, there's not enough market for a separate book on high school and college and so on, like there would be in California. There are actually 15 books on, on, on California politics and stuff. I, I closely follow state politics in that regard. So, so that's the reason for it. The, um, uh, 
information about the book on the on the uh, back table there. Uh, there's a copy of the book, as Freya said, and also there's some handouts about the book, uh, which, which tells you about the uh, uh, chapters in the book and so on, and there's also a website on the book there. Uh, this is the most expensive book, from what I understand, the Alaska University of Alaska Press has uh, ever published. I've got probably five times more of my own money into this book than I'll ever get out of it. The index alone in this book cost $4,700, so you can see it's, it wasn't a cheap operation. But I enjoyed doing it. It was a real experience. I, uh, I'm a political, Alaska political junkie, so I, I was happy to do that. But I figured it this way, that all the permanent funds I made in 33 years in Alaska have gone back into this book. So that's my contribution to Alaska, you might say. Okay, so what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about the Alaska economy, what I refer to as the as wishful thinking and the actual realities. In other words, looking at Alaska's economy in a general sense uh, and looking at the, uh, the, the way that people like to think about it or think what might be able to be achieved versus what the reality of, of the Alaska economy really is. So, I've re divided my talk into five parts. First of all, I'm going to make some introductory comments about things. Secondly, I'm going to talk about the, the economic environment in which Alaska finds itself. Thirdly, I'm going to talk about some suggestions that people have made about how to deal with the state's economy, how to, how to boost it, how to make it better, whatever. Fourthly, I'm going to look at some of the possibilities and what are some of the options that... Uh, Alaska can pursue, and then finally just some concluding comments about some things here. So, let me start. Okay, probably in Alaska politics, no other issue is more significant or constantly reoccurs And how do we deal with Alaska's economy and its instability because of its dependent on oil revenues? It's probably the central issue in Alaska politics. It has been for many years. Uh, it's less important when oil prices are high, as you all know, but it's certainly a significant issue all the time. And so politicians constantly deal with this issue and are seeking solutions. You, you, get, many, you get many suggestions, people, particularly people who are running for office as opposed to those who are in office. Well... These people don't know what they're doing down there in Juneau, and they need to start thinking outside the box. I never figured out what that means, but people talk about it. They need to figure out, start thinking outside the box because there's ways we can deal with this issue. It's not a problem, really. It's just those people down there in Juneau don't know what they're doing. They're self-serving. They're just there for their salaries and so on. Well, it might be one way of looking at it, but okay. But let's look at some of the early rea some realities. Alaska has by far the most unbalanced economy in the United States. What do we mean by that? We mean that in a normal, those of you who know a little bit of econ, don't want to insult you, but you know, basically a balanced economy would be one where there was a relationship between manufacturing, okay, between agriculture or agribusiness, services, and also government. A lot of people say, well, government's not legitimate, but it is. It pumps money into the economy, particularly in this state. So let's take the extreme example, California or should we say Massachusetts, or Texas. Those are very balanced economies. When you come out west and you come to the mountain states like New Mexico, Montana particularly, Idaho, they're much less balanced. Uh, you know, a place like Montana has mining, not much manufacturing, but it does have, and it has oil and gas, of course, which has become quite controversial recently with the pipeline. Those are not very balanced economies, but they're nothing compared with Alaska. I mean, Alaska has no manufacturing versus, worth you know, talking about. Agriculture has never been important. People from the maps will say, well, it is, but it's not really. I mean, it's insignificant. It doesn't even come up as half of 1% of the Alaska's you know, gross, national, uh, gross domestic product. So you've got a very unbalanced economy uh, based largely, of course, upon natural resources, which feeds government. There are two basic economic drivers in Alaska. One of them is oil, 
And the second one is the federal government. Now, not, a lot of you will be surprised by that, but the federal government is a major source of income in Alaska for all sorts of ways. And I can talk about that more later uh, if we get the chance. I just want to mention that because I'll, uh, I'll show you some ways in which that works later on. So you got those now, of course, oil feeds state government. And state government obviously is a major employer in this state and also, of course, a major source of income. So that, those two things are uh, very important. Of course, Alaska is largely based upon natural resources. A natural resource economy, uh, just like Wyoming is, just like to a large extent Montana is, and uh, uh, that's, that, that's been the reality for, you know, ever since statehood. First of all, of course, salmon, uh, timber, or lumber, and of course, since... Uh, the late 60s, early 70s, oil. Okay. Alaska is, next point to make, Alaska is subject to the boom-bust economy. In other words, and you know this, it goes uh, through these cycles, the ups and downs, due largely, of course, to uh, the price of oil upon which the state is so dependent. And, you know, a state like Texas or California, and, of course, Texas is a big oil state, um, California is a small oil state, but even when oil prices are down, in those states. You've got so much other aspects of the economy, uh, manufacturing, services, and so on, that it doesn't have the effect that it would have in Alaska for obvious reasons. Okay. Okay. So now many, there have been many schemes suggested to how to deal with this issue. And there are, of course, as I say, people running for office often and other people have all these suggestions about how we can deal with this issue. And if we only got the right uh, solution, it would all be fine. Okay, we'll go into some of those later, but this is a common thing. You hear it from people all the time about how to do things. Okay, but my final point in terms of my intro is this, that many schemes have been tried, many schemes have been suggested, but there's been no answer that has come up. There's no answer that's come up. And the question is, why is that? Okay, my final point is this, in terms of my intro. Politicians in this state have virtually no influence on the Alaska economy in terms of affecting it in any way. They have minor, they can minorly tweak it. They can maybe do some encouraging, but they really have very little influence on the economy. Now, politicians won't tell you that because no politician is going to say, well, I'm going to go down there to Juno and I don't really have any influence on the economy, but please elect me. They're going to say, yeah, I've got this plan and I'm going to do this and we're going to, we're going to do this and we're going to do that, some of which I'll talk to you about in a moment. And uh, we're going to get things right, okay? Well, let's turn to my second section now. Let's talk about the environment, the economic environment in which Alaska operates. What, is the, what are the major elements that influence the, Alaska, or, or influence the Alaska economy and what Alaska can and cannot do economically? Well, there are three of these elements which are very significant. And the first one of these is not even an economics 101 principle. It's really a remedial economic point, and that is this. Alaska operates in a free enterprise or capitalist system where people produce at the lowest possible cost and they sell at the highest possible cost. You know, it's the basic principle of capitalism, the basic principle of what are, you know, you can call it the free enterprise system. It sounds very simple, but it's fundamental. And this is at the root of several of Alaska's economic problems and prevent, provides hurdles which are difficult to overcome. Secondly, Alaska lives and operates within a, a national and an international free trade economy. There's always, of course, been free trade within the 50 states. It's part of the U.S. Constitution. No barriers can be put up between states. You know, the, the Commerce Clause says that. So there's never been barriers between the states. There was, of course, in the old Articles of Confederation, and that's why one reason for the Founding Fathers met in Philadelphia to change the Constitution. But also, internationally, you know, the last 25 or 30 years particularly, uh, there's been negotiations, particularly with major uh, world economies, European Union, uh, East Asia, and so on, so that there's virtually free trade between the countries of the world now, essentially. I mean, some Latin American countries like Brazil and so on, uh, 
We still have barriers, but basically we're talking more or less free trade. So what this means, for those who know a little bit of economics, is that you get the principle of comparative advantage settling in. When you have free trade, certain places that produce certain things efficiently, which means at the lowest possible cost, those those places will concentrate on those issues, like oranges in Florida, for example, uh, you know, high tech in Silicon Valley and in the, uh, you know, in the Boston region of, of Massachusetts, and you'll get other places producing things, you know, obviously wheat in, 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 in Kansas or in Iowa and corn in Kansas, uh, and not that sort of production in New England, which has not got the soil or the terrain. So, so you get comparative advantages set in. That's what happens. And you produce things at the lowest possible cost in those areas. Okay, the third point, fundamentally, is this. It is unlikely, extremely unlikely, that a government or a state government or people working in state government will be able to root out the best investments and to be able to provide the wherewithal to do those. The free enterprise system and people who pursue investments for, for a living, those are the people that probably, not probably, but will determine where the best investments are to be made. And if there is a, there's money to be made, they will invest in that place. That's just the nature of capitalism. Now, I'm not saying capitalism is a good thing or a bad thing. In fact, I have very strong opinions on parts of that, but that's not why you're here today. But it does tend to distribute resources based upon cost. And investors don't invest in horseshoes because nobody, not very few people, use horses anymore. So that's, that's important too. Okay. So let's look at uh, some of the uh, schemes that have been, or some ideas that have been proposed for uh, dealing with the Alaska economy. Well, one, the first one I would say is this. You've probably heard it many times, or at least you've watched it. It's what I call the if-only syndrome. If only the feds would get off our backs. If only the environmentalists, you know, we could get them under control. If only, you know, people would realize that we could start a high-tech industry, you know, in Anchorage and so on and the rest of it. Um, you know, this syndrome is it sort of, you know, what you might call the victim syndrome. You know, we in Alaska have been victimized and, you know, we just, you know, we're sort of hunkered down sort of thing, and, which is one of the things actually that governors tend to do. They, particularly Wally Hickel, you remember Wally probably, who, who sort of saw Alaska as being beleaguered by the federal government. He saw it as this kind of this gladiator, um, sort of David against Goliath, but in this case, Goliath won and probably will always win in that case. It was the federal government. So there's that. Okay, there's that thing. The second thing is what I would call, to be rather nasty about it, harebrained schemes. There are many harebrained schemes, you know, get people go down to go down to Juno or they're thinking, they say, hey, I've got an idea, okay? The idea is, why don't we bring in old used cars from the bush, melt them down in Anchorage and start making steel, okay? Or, although he's dead now, but we we'll, can say this, Wally Hickel's plan, some of you may remember this, to have a giant hose pipe all the way from southeast Alaska down to Southern California to take water down there, okay? Um, there are other schemes. I won't go into any more, but there are other schemes, which obviously are, they are hate brain. They're ridiculous. You know, I mean, it's, it's somebody suggesting something, but it's not going to work. The third thing uh, we might say are the state subsidizing certain types of uh, things. And to a certain extent, this can work. For example, some of you may, well, probably most of you have heard of the Red Dog Mine up in uh, northwest Alaska. Uh, the state helped develop that road to the Red Dog Mine. I mean, it helped that. And, and then Kamenko, who was the Canadian company that came in, you know, it encouraged them to come in. It encouraged them to come in to a certain extent. Uh, you know, Sean Parnell, before he uh, got defeated here two years ago, he had this idea of, of Roads to resources, roads to resource places, and so on. Now, this sounds like a good idea, and to a certain extent, it might work. But it's hard to know to what extent this actually 
encourages business. Another example is, you know, the oil company credits, which has been, was a big issue last session, you know, in terms of the governor proposing reducing them considerably and the legislature not wanting to. But let me go back to one of my points about the fundamentals of the Alaska economy. If those places, those mines, those developments were viable economically, investors would be here and they would be, they would be developing those things, more, most likely. Now, we're not saying that a little bit of a helping hand doesn't help a certain amount. But generally speaking, if people see money in them, they would develop them. A good example is the Pebble Mine in southeast, southwest Alaska. Now, Pebble will probably never open because of the environmental uh, power, power of the environmental community. But basically, the investors in Pebble believed it would be viable. It, didn't, it, didn't, it doesn't have any state aid, but they believed it would be viable. And I guess without the environmentalists, it probably would be. It would be open now. <laughs> The same with the Kensington mine here uh, and Gold and, and, and Gold I mean, it, it, it's true. So generally speaking, subsidies can work, but they're very limited in what they can do. And sometimes they're completely a waste of money. You know, in the, I don't know how many of you were in the 80s. I got here in 1980. Alaska uh, tried to subsidize agriculture. They built a grain elevator in Valdez. They opened a thing called the Matt Made Dairy. And so these things went bankrupt because they just weren't viable economically. You know, the Matt made dairy was very nice and the milk was pretty good, but if you could get a gallon of milk for five dollars less from from you know shipped up from Seattle, people didn't buy Matt made milk. Because the competition, back to the competition thing, is that you know Alaska couldn't produce it to that extent. Another another element in trying to deal with the economy is trying to encourage uh, you know, just by, not, not by subsidy, but just try to encourage uh, the development of certain industries or certain things. And I'm going to hit three things here. One of them is the Arctic. Second one is the whole Pacific Rim sort of syndrome that people talk about. And the other one, one I'll start with, is the idea of attracting industry to Alaska. I did a talk show in Anchorage about three weeks ago, uh, a calling talk show, and uh, a guy called in and he said, you know, why don't we have, you know, I don't think politicians really know what they're doing here. He said, we could have a high-tech industry in Anchorage. We could get, you know, things going. We could get, we could really get that industry going. We could have people come up here and do all sorts of things. And we could really get the economy going. But there isn't a high-tech industry in Alaska, in Anchorage, and probably never will be. Simple. One. It's much more expen it would be much more expensive to produce things in Anchorage. There's no, with all due respect to the University of Alaska, for which I taught for 30 years, it doesn't have the sorts of programs that Stanford and Berkeley and uh, you know UC Santa Cruz have producing engineers that employers can go out and get immediately. It doesn't have that. Secondly, it doesn't have uh, the infrastructure necessary, and to ship things out of there, even if it's software stuff, it's going to be expensive. But most important of all, although you and I love Alaska, most people don't want to move to Alaska. I mean, if you were if you were living in the Bay Area, making two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and can actually afford to buy an apartment, which even at that price might be tough, but you could, and your family was there, why would you move to Anchorage? I mean, you know, I like Anchorage. And it's a lot different than when I first came here in 1980. Most people, you know this, almost every American outside of the state wants to come to Alaska. Oh, yeah, I want to go. They never say, I want to go to Iowa one day. I want to go to Kansas. But they say, hey, I want to go to Alaska. But they only want to come for a visit and then go home. They don't want to stay. And most people who come to Alaska, of course, come for a job. But, but it's unlikely that you're going to get that industry here. Let's move quickly to the Arctic. How are we doing for time? Not too bad. Um, the Arctic. This is seen to be the panacea for Alaska, the Arctic. Okay. Well, what does that mean? What it meant drilling oil in the, you know, in the Chukchi Sea and so on. And, of course, Shell spent $8 billion drilling in the Chukchi and they couldn't come up with anything. Why? Because it wasn't economically viable. And they gave it a shot. It didn't work. 
so they pulled out. And so did Statoil, which was a Norwegian oil company that was doing similar work. The Corps of Engineers then canceled the development of the deep water port in Nome. And the U.S. Department of the Interior canceled leases or canceled lease sales in the Chukchi because no one was applying for them. Why? Because it wasn't economical. So, quite frankly, and sadly, I guess, for Governor Walker and me, Treble particularly, the Arctic is really not much of a viable opportunity. Probably you won't see more development in the Arctic for many years to come. Okay. So, there's a fact. Okay, let's quickly talk about the Pacific Rim, and then I'll, I want to talk about this idea of value added, which is another big thing that people talk about. The Pacific Rim. Okay, people say, well, you know, Alaska is right up in the northern part of the uh, United States, right near the Arctic, and of course, it's quite, it, it's proximity to the to the you know the Asian Far East, to Japan, you know, to South Korea, and so other places is right. So it should be able to develop, you know, trade with the Far East. But once again, it doesn't have the infrastructure or the you know, the, the economic development uh, entities that need it. As much as, you know, you, if you go down to San Francisco, which is a major financial center in the West Coast, or you go down to Seattle, which has, you know, all sorts of uh, uh, industry and services with the Internet these days and other things, it's, why would you set up something in Alaska just because it's geographically closer? It doesn't make sense. And in fact, many ventures that Alaska's had with the Far East have not worked out. Now, Governor Walker, of course, has a plan to build a pipeline from the North Slope down to uh, you know, the Kenai and send liquefied natural gas uh, to the Far East. But you know, that's at least 10 years away. If the pipeline started to be built tomorrow, it wouldn't come online until 2027, 2028. So really, the Far East thing is not really very viable either, although it sounds good. I mean, it sounds, it's, they sound intuitively good, but when you get down to the actual fact of seeing them work. Just a final point here, and then I'll talk a bit about uh, what we can do or what can be done. Value added. This is a thing people always talk about. You know, we, we have a lot of fish in the state. We bring fish in. Why can't we make fish sticks? You know, why don't we, we have, uh, you know, lots and lots of, uh, uh, you know, shellfish that are more, shrimp that are more, why can't we, you know, package those up and, and, and you know, ship those out? So we have a sort of a manufacturing business. Well, once again, let's come back to the basics that we talked about in the beginning. One, competition. Secondly, the free trade idea. If it were, if it were a good idea and economically feasible to produce fish sticks, should we say down in Alaska or somewhere like that, investors would have jumped at it and it would be doing done. Why isn't it being done? Because it's not economically viable. It's much cheaper to ship the fish someplace in Seattle or maybe down to one of the fish processing plants on the Oregon coast and produce it there and ship it back as fish sticks. And this is one of the things that people don't seem to understand. It's like, why, why do we ship our oil all the way down to, you know, down to Southern California they turn it into gas, and we buy the gas back here. Why don't we do it in Alaska? Well, we, we have had a couple of process plants, but it's just not, it's, it's not viable economically. And once again, we have to go back to the basics of our, uh, you know, the things we talked about, the environment in which Alaska lives. So let me just say a few things about, I've got about another 10 minutes. Uh, what, what actually uh, can be done? Well, let me preface this by saying this. I preface this by saying this, you know? Human beings are extremely resourceful animals. And they figure out things best they can. And, and they do amazing things. Put a man on the moon. You know, develop the internet. So if there were a solution to this problem of Alaska's economy, someone would have figured it out a long time ago. It will be figured out and we'd be pursuing that today but there isn't a 
solution to it. Now, a lot of politicians, maybe some listen to this, say, that Thomas, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I've got all these plans. Tell me. Tell me what they are. Show us how it's going to be viable economically, given the Alaska environment we talked about. Show me. I'd be, I'd be very happy to see them. In fact, if you told me, I'd make some money out of them. I'd invest. Even though I lost my permanent fund uh, writing this book, I, I can probably find some other money. Okay. So what is, what is the, what are the possibilities? Well, the first thing that Alaska ought to do, if it's, and I, I don't want to sound like Bill Walker here, okay? I'm not, I'm not necessarily a Bill Walker fan. I wasn't in the state to vote for Bill Walker. I don't know whether Bill Walker's doing a good, or, I, I have my opinion, doing a good or bad job. I'm not, I'm not here to, to represent Governor Walker, but I am saying some things that he's come up with, okay? Because I happen to think that he started a conversation that should have been started 30 years ago in the state. Really, really should have been. The first thing we've got to do is sever, and I mean sever, separate the Alaska economy and its future from oil revenues. Because what, that, that, that connection, that, that apparently inseparable connection is behind the boom-bust cycle in Alaska and the economy. And, and it's, its effects are, can be devastating. You know, once you lose... You, hire, you fire people from the state or, you, or people who are working in a business in Anchorage lose their jobs because the place closes. That, you can't get that back. Plus, the people that leave the state are not the old people like me or the young kids that can't. If they're teachers graduating from college at UAA or UAF and they're, they don't see an opportunity, so they go, you know, they move to Washington, they move back to D.C. or, you know, back east or something. And those are the people we should be keeping in Alaska because those are the people that are the future of the state. You know, not the old guys like me uh, and the people about to take their retirement from the state. So we've got to do that. That's the first thing we've got to do, okay? Secondly, Alaska has the wherewithal to do that. It has the wherewithal to do that. It has a permanent fund of $55 billion, $55 billion. And in fact, the only way to deal with this economy is in some way to combine natural resource revenues with some restructuring of the permanent fund. Now, once again, I'm not arguing for Walker, but if you look at the, you know, I don't, some of you may have heard about ISER, the Institute of Social and Economic Research. And there are a couple of economists up there. One is Scott Goldsmith, who's a very, very respected guy, Gunnar Knapp, both of whom retired, but that's what they say. And, and it's not, it's not their opinions. It's just the only way that things will work. Alaska has that wherewithal to do those things. Now, Let's, let's maybe look at a couple of other possibilities. That might, well, what about taxes? Well, let's increase taxes. Well, if we, if there were a state income tax, which of course there was until 1980, let's say there was a state income tax, and it was, should we say, 10% of federal, which is, you know, common in the, across the states, and it wasn't a separate tax, like in Oregon or something. And if you had a 5% state sales tax, we're not saying you could because it would be problematical because some places have sales taxes already and it would be outrageous, but let's say you could you bring in only about 25 to 28 percent of what oil revenues bring in at the sort of $80 a barrel thing, which gives the, the state budget what it was three years ago, which is a fairly sustainable state budget. So, you know, even that alone, it's not going to, uh, you know, it's not going to work. So the only thing you can do is you can, you've got to do something with the permanent fund and meld that with natural resource uh, revenues. But of course, as we all know, <laughs> politics gets in the way. And, of course, people don't look upon it that way because, you know, everybody in the legislature, every legislator has a particular, you know, agenda of some type. And, obviously, last session that was not the agenda that the governor had. And, of course, I think there's probably also a wishful thinking syndrome that, well, if we only wait a year or two, oil prices will go back up. They go up to 80 or 100 or 110 dollars a barrel, and that could happen. It happened before. Those of you who were in '86, uh, you know, we had a couple of years of pretty bad prices. Then we had, um, you know, the Gulf War, and uh, prices went back up again. Then it went down in, in Knowles administration, and they got pretty low. And then Frank Murkowski came along, and he was going to cut the budget by five percent a year for three years. And then oil prices went back up, and everybody went, "Don't have to do any planning now. It's good. We can just go on as we did." So that could happen. But in terms of the long term, 
the state probably needs to do something to give it this annual income that it can, in fact, use to, to insulate itself from oil prices. Now, Alaska is always going to be a natural resource extraction economy for the reasons I think I've argued today. And, you know, you can come back and argue against me. I'm not saying I have the answer to this. But the basic economics says that Alaska is always going to be a natural resource economy. And now whether or not the gas pipeline can be built is another factor. But even if it did, as I said, it's 10 years away. And who knows what the price of natural gas will be then? And why do you think that the three major producers on the North Slope are very happily backing off being partners in this pipeline? If there were a lot of money to be made, or thought they could, they'd be doing it. But of course, 10 years' time, they don't know what the price of natural gas would be. More important to them. They don't know what the tax is going to be, which is why they wanted a constitutional amendment uh, to, to, to give them a, a predictable tax level, which, of course, probably most Alaskans would never agree. I don't know. I'm just guessing what, what happened. So I think that, you know, you've got to consider that. And as I said, if there was a solution to it, some would have figured out. So anyway, I'm just going to conclude here. So back to what I said at the beginning. Most politicians, all politicians, really have very little influence on the Alaska economy because it's subject to these world forces because of competition, because of free trade, and of course, as we said, if there were opportunities to invest here, investors would be here right away. They would actually be here, but there's not. I mean, so that's the problem. Okay, so what is Alaska going to do? It could lurch from crisis to crisis. That's what's happened in the last 35 or 40 years. You know, you, you sort of try to you know, bear out the bad times, hoping that things will change. And they have changed. That's the unfortunate thing in many ways, that the prices do go back up. And so people say, well, and I, I don't know for certain, but I've talked to several uh, former students of mine who work in the legislature and a couple of legislators who are friends of mine, and, and, and they sort of hint, well, maybe prices will go back up and we won't have to do anything. Because it's very difficult politically to deal with things. I mean, obviously, they couldn't deal with the permanent fund dividend this year as a group. The governor had to deal with it, you know, with, with reducing it to $1,000. So that's the hard thing. How do you get consensus there? So you're going to lurch from crisis to crisis, basically. Um, so there's that. But uh, my final point is this. You know, you just – the Alaska economy is not going to change. And so what you've got to do – I'm going to use this terrible phrase that I hate. You've got to think outside the box, okay? <laughs> so you can't look at traditional ways of dealing with the Alaska economy. The only way to deal with it is, in fact, sending outside the box for most, for most states. And that is this permanent fund, this $55 billion that you have in the bank that you can use in some way or another to deal with this constant economic cycle of boom bust to be able to insulate it against that so anyway that's my um my uh, sort of uh, spiel today about those things you know it's not exactly the most uh, complicated or advanced uh, presentation but i think or i hope that i've raised your awareness about some things that maybe dispelled some of the wishful thinking which is i mean we all should be positive about things but you know this is not a situation where you can put things off it's it's a reality and i think that the state should face up to this, but you know, politically, it's another matter. So, anyway, anybody have any questions? I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. If you don't, uh, that's fine too. Yes. I have a question about um, the testimony argument. Yeah. Um, and I know what you said, you know, historically, it's wrong. My understanding of some of the arguments is that, you know, we haven't solved it up until now, that, that we haven't, that this, the companies haven't worked up until now, it's probably not like they've been working on before. But with the Arctic, I mean, Right. Passage. Do you see some sort of shift or new conditions that are going to maybe have an impact on, you know, whether or not we should be building the infrastructure that the DOD wants, or is there, you know, is there an Arctic play on the Arctic? It might be. I think that you know the, the climate change, and you know, you've probably heard about this boat that went through. Uh, uh, that way and went to New York for only $55,000 a, a, a person, which is, I think, a pretty good deal, don't you? Uh, it's like Hillary Clinton making $210,000 for a dinner speech. It's, it's kind of expensive. But anyway, so, yeah, I don't know. For, I, I really can't answer your question. I mean, uh, I think it may, in terms of shipping, it may improve some shipping, 
Um, but I don't know, what are you talking about in terms of infrastructure? I mean, obviously, you know, the deep water port that the, that the Corps of Engineers were going to build in Nome, you know, they obviously don't think that's viable. It would have been if, if, if Shell had struck oil and was going to continue that and other companies do that. But the other thing about it is, too, uh, you know, it costs about six times as much to produce a barrel of oil out of the Arctic than it does in Saudi Arabia. So you've got to have a good oil price. I think it, I don't know exactly what it was, but it's about over fifty dollars a barrel to make it viable to tap that oil. Whereas you, oil at six dollars a barrel will be fine out of Saudi Arabia. So it, there's so many unknowns about it, and it really is a crapshoot in many ways. So I can't really answer your question, but it, I think the Arctic is is one of these you know sort of hopeful things out there. We could, should deal with this thing, and I'm not sure how. How viable is our best bet, quite frankly, is if we can do it, although it takes some years, is to build the gas pipeline, but to do the things we've talked about here, and what Governor Walker's talking about, about somehow using the permit fund. It's the only answer to this question, this problem. There really isn't any, there's nothing else out there. Look, the, the constitutional budget reserve is being sort of gradually drained as you don't make decisions about, you know, restructuring the permanent fund. So. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds depressing, right? You know, but, and it is. But in times of high oil prices, people don't think about it. It's like everything else. Human beings don't tend to do things in advance unless they're compulsive planners. They wait till something needs to be done, and then they do it. It's just, it's just a human thing, and I think it's true in politics. So. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you talked about fish sticks. Um, yeah. The... Uh, um, we talked about fish sticks and the idea that um, we would be doing, we would be making the fish sticks here if we could make them here, if it made sense. They would already be happening. It made economic sense. Yeah, if yeah. it made economic sense. Yeah. Um, but but I, I look at things like uh, like fracking in North Dakota where technology changes what makes sense. Um, yeah. What do you think about um, like forward-looking technologies that might impact Alaska? Oh, I think it probably could. I mean, I don't know what they would be. But, I mean, what you've got, you've got to do two things. You've got to, if you're shipping something physical, you've got to be able to compete with shipping costs of those goods in other places. In other words, if you're going to ship something from even out of Ketchikan, say, for example, let alone out of Anchorage, if you're going to ship something to the lower 40, whether it be Seattle or whether it be Long Beach, California or whatever, it's got to be cheaper than shipping it you know, from another place because otherwise it won't happen. Now, there are some things in Alaska, obviously. The people are, that are, are, are unique, you know, uh, the scenery, um, you know, salmon and so on and, and all sorts of other things. But there's only up to a point that people will pay for those because they can get similar experiences in the Alps. They can, you know, they can buy Penray salmon from, you know, from Canada or from Chile and so on. So there's, there's only a certain amount of things there. I think technology may, may affect that. Um, I'm not quite sure what it would be, but, you know, it could happen. I don't know, you know, what it would be. It hasn't happened so far. I mean, if you look at the Alaska economy today in uh, 2016, it's not that much different in terms of competition. Obviously, we have oil now. We didn't have it in 1959. But it really isn't that much different in terms of its, uh, its composition, its viability. We just have a different natural resource that we rely upon, which is oil versus timber and salmon and so on, although fishing is still important. And so but nothing. I mean, oil just dwarfs everything. I mean, it's it's nothing comes close to oil. I mean, it, it just doesn't. Uh, so I don't know the once again, like the question about the article. I'm not sure, but it could happen. But I can't personally see what it would be. But you know, on the other hand, who could see the internet uh, in 1980? Who could see cell phones in 1976? Um, you know, who could see social media in 2005? You know, I mean, so I don't know. But it, it could. I mean, it could make it could make that difference. The only problem is if Alaska has that technology, so may other places. You know what I mean? I don't know. Somebody else? Maybe, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, um, with Norway and the lessons that we've been learned from the um, You mean their, their, their permanent their fund? Their permanent fund, their oil. Oh, yeah, yeah. How they're handling all that and how we could benefit from maybe some of their ideas. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I know a fair bit about the, you know, there's this thing called the government pension fund in, in, in uh, Norway. It's a very amazing thing. Let me just give you a quick bit of background about it. The Alaska Permanent Fund began in 1976. Uh, it's now worth 55. If you look on the, I worked on the website this morning, so I'd be up to date. 
Okay, it's just under fifty-five billion dollars now. Okay, it's the twenty-fifth largest, what we call sovereign wealth fund in the world. I mean, uh, just at twenty-five, by far the largest in just in, in the United States. There, Texas has one. New Mexico has one. North Dakota started one several years ago. In Norway, Norway actually has two funds, but the one that they have, which is called the uh, the government uh, pension fund, is worth today. $890 billion. It will be the first sovereign wealth fund to hit a trillion dollars. Now that, of course, comes all from uh, from North Sea oil. But you see, the interesting thing is the Norwegians don't pay a permanent fund dividend. They just use that money and they invest it for the very reasons that we talked about here to try to balance out their economy. And they, they use it, to, interestingly enough, <laughs> they use it to make their country greener. They, they will give you a $10,000 subsidy to buy electric car. But interestingly enough, they invest in oil industries and natural gas pipelines, which of course makes an even bigger footprint. So there's a little bit of inconsistency there, okay? But, but I don't know, to get back to your question, ma'am, I'm not sure what we could learn from them in terms of the development of their fund. I mean, they've just been very fortunate because they put larger amounts away uh, and uh, I think that they, uh, uh, you know, they, they've gone about using it in the in the right way. But you see, I don't want to get too deep here. But they have a parliamentary system. In a parliamentary system, some of you know, the executive is drawn from the legislature, and so the executive in the part is basically can dictate things, which I know make Americans sort of flinch and so you know. But we have a separation of power system here, where the president. The Congress, the governor, the legislature are pretty much co-equal. I mean, in a parliamentary system, you decide to do something. The party is in power. The party in the legislature goes along with the executive because that's what happens, and they do things. Ninety-five percent of legislation in Britain or Germany or Norway is proposed gets passed. It's less than 20 percent in the United States. And I'm not saying that's good or bad because they're both different systems, but I'm saying that you can do more in a place like Norway than you could in the United States. I mean, if this were England, or if this were Norway, or if this were Australia, we wouldn't have this problem in Alaska, because somebody would figure it out and say, hey, we've got to do something about this, and you'd have a party come in and do this. And I'm not saying, you know, that's good or bad. I'm just saying it's just different, you see, I think, in that regard. So anyway, what about one more question, because I think we're probably out of time. Yes? I've got to go out of here with some hope, isn't it? Okay, I know, yeah, really. Yeah. Well, move, move to Washington State. It's doing very well. <laughs> We yep. did a survey of some major business corporations around the country. Yeah. And the top two reasons, we we're trying to understand disincentives yeah. for investing in Alaska yeah. within the era of Science and Technology Foundation. And I remember that, yeah, sure. Going on. And the top two reasons that employers gave us were one, transportation costs, and two, a viable workforce. And so I'm just wondering what kind of factors of production or changes could be in place that would give us some hope that may, I mean, if we ended up with a top-notch workforce, there's a movement in Juneau right now to invest in pre-K education so kids have a good foundation and we start growing the best workforce. If we had carbon tax that maybe um, equalize some of the transportation costs, what are some influences on those factors of production that could put us back in the ballgame? Okay. We don't have an hour, but I'll try and sum it up in a minute, okay? Okay, first of all, let's take the transportation thing, okay? You can say, well, transportation costs are, are they're much lower now to Alaska than they used to be, but they're also much lower for other places. So, you know, once again, the competition thing, okay? I think, I mean, my own personal opinion, which is not to do with this thing, I think the two things that Alaska's got going for it are natural resources and education. Exactly what you're saying. You've got to produce an, you know, you've got to produce a workforce that people want to, to employ. The problem is, with all due respect to the University of Alaska and to the new president, Jim Johnson, who was one of my students in the past here, or one of my colleagues when he first came to Alaska, the university is cutting itself back. It's never been a first, you know, a world-class university except for in some very minor areas like Arctic biology and so on. You're not going to have, they're cutting programs out. You're not going to have the people coming out of there that employers would want to, I mean, they might want to hire some, but you're not going to get a very first class for what you do in the Bay Area, for example, or you do in, you know, in the Boston area, or you do in, say, Dallas-Fort Worth, or you do in, you know, in the Chicago area. You're meeting.